starting recording. Okay, so what I figured we'd do is, you know, uh, talk a little bit about my trip. Uh, like I said, I literally just got back. I went from April 10th, or my fiance and I went from April 10th through uh, the 16th. So we just got back a couple days ago. I'm still a little bit, uh, so I'm just like a couple hours behind now, so I'm, I'm not doing too bad. Um, we took J, uh, Japan Airlines business on their new Sky Suites. Uh, we took it from Dallas to Tokyo on the way over. Uh, and then immediately upon landing, we took the bullet train down to Kyoto, where we stayed down there for four nights in the Ritz Carlton. And then we uh, took the train back up to Tokyo and we spent one full day in Tokyo, stayed at the Andes in Tokyo, uh, and then rode Japan Airlines first class on the way home. So I figured I'd kind of break, you know, this conversation into four sections, talk about business class on Japan Airlines and then the hotels, the hotel and just Kyoto in general, and then touch on uh, Tokyo real quick. Uh, and then a little bit on the, the uh, NRT to ORD route is what I flew on uh, first class on the way back. It's absolutely amazing, but everything was amazing. Um, so I want to first touch on, we'll start with Japan Airlines, the the uh, business class uh, on the new Sky Suite. But before I even do that, I have to, because I'm going to be drinking out of this, I have to share everybody this. So on my, on my first class flight, uh, you know, I'm, we're getting ready to land, uh, maybe an hour or two out. I asked for a coffee and they hand me like the, the famous glass, the mug. And I tell the stewardess, you know, I've been waiting for two years, I've been waiting to drink out of this mug, and I was, I was so excited. And, and I said, "If there any way I could buy this mug or something like that," and she says, "No, no, no, sorry, you know, it's it's only for the plane, yada yada." And as I'm leaving the plane, she wraps up two of them and gives me two of the JL first class coffee mugs. So amazing! So I got my tea in there now because I'm not drinking coffee this late. But oh uh, man. Just made made my whole day. Yeah, and they really are. It was amazing. So I'm so happy I got I got two first class mugs. So sweet. Anyways, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about uh, just that Japan Airlines, the business class on the new Sky Suite, the Dallas to NRT route. Uh, so I want to preference it by saying I've never so much as taken. Uh, I mean, I know I lot know a lot of you guys know me from from Reddit and. You know, I've done a lot and I've accumulated a lot of miles and I'd like to think I'm pretty good at doing all this. Um, but in the same sense, I haven't redeemed anything. So I'm knowledgeable and I'm, I, I like to think I'm helpful to a lot of you guys. But in the same regards, I've never taken a domestic first class flight, let alone an international, you know, Japan Airlines business or Japan Airlines first class. So it was like literally my first international flight was, well, I went down to Jamaica in February, but you know, uh, at a long haul flight, my first one was the Sky Suite on Japan Airlines, and then my my second long haul flight was uh, Japan Airlines first class on the way back. So uh, I don't speak with a lot of experience, um, but I feel like that gives me a unique edge when I'm talking about this stuff. So we took our we took our uh, our route from uh, Pittsburgh to Dallas. I think our plane we left around seven. I want to say we got to Dallas around nine or so. And we had three hour layover in Dallas, so I was kind of um, I was kind of excited about that because I wanted to see the Centurion Lounge and get to hang out there a little bit. And I hear so much good stuff about it. Uh, so as soon as we land, you know, I'm scattering around looking for the Centurion Lounge, and it's actually the same terminal. I think Terminal D. So that's where we flew in at, or maybe we were, we were in, we turned in we flew into Terminal C. We were departing uh, Terminal D. So uh, we made our way over to Terminal D and I check into the Centurion Lounge and the beautiful IV background and everything I was just so excited to step in there and you, you bust out your card. Um, you know, everything's sweet. They ask if you want like a massage or anything like that because it's all included at that, um, at that lounge. So I have to say I was entirely underwhelmed uh, by that lounge. Everybody says, everybody talks about how amazing it is. The food spread is great. It just, you know, it's the most spectacular thing. Like I said, we were there like 9, 30, 10. Uh, there was a two hour wait for any of the spa services. So I didn't get any spa services because I didn't have the two and a half. I think it was like a two and a half hour wait. And the 
the lounge is not laid out like a typical lounge. So it's made out um, in like long hallways and corridors. So it was really weird because it was it was busy. It was extremely busy in there. You couldn't hardly find a seat. And everything was just like really small and crammed. You had a couple chairs. Um, I don't know, I was frozen up for a second. Is you have a couple chairs and then you have like a hallway where people are walking. So it's really difficult to um, get anything done. You know, you don't feel any privacy because there's constantly people standing right beside you like the entire time. So I wasn't a fan of it. The, the food spread, you know, I guess was a little bit better than your typical uh, club. But overall, uh, I was just disappointed with the Centurion Lounge. I, I wasn't a fan. So, and, and my fiance felt the same way. So, and I, it's not like I, I don't really know lounge as much. I've only gone to a few. But we instantly, you know, we sat down for a little bit. Uh, we, we got up, just decided this wasn't for us. We went down to the Admirals Club on in Terminal D, which is their newest, I believe, in DFW. They have four Admirals Club lounges in that airport, so they have one at each terminal, A, B, C, and D. So we made our way over to D uh, and just felt much more at home. So you only get one drink. They give you a coupon for a complimentary drink when you walk in. Um, I don't know if it's like maybe they're higher end drinks or I don't I don't know if or, you know exactly what the coupon was for. I ended up just getting a um, like an orange juice or something. I you know I wasn't really, I, I wasn't more anticipating the flight than anything else. So took it kind of easy. But the tarmac views were beautiful. It was busy, but it was really spacious, so you didn't really feel like you were overcrowded. Um, and like I said, just the views of the runway, and you could see the planes taking off and landing and see them loading up. I thought it was much cooler than sitting at the gate and it was way better than the Centurion Lounge. So that's my advice if you're in DFW. You have to stop in the Centurion Lounge just because it's there. Um, but definitely make sure to leave some time for the Admirals Club because it's it's really nice. The food spread there was a little bit more basic, but um, so space-wise, it just felt a lot more comfortable for us. And the view was far superior. So overall, the better, better choice. Um, so then we head down to the airport um, or head down to my gate. Uh, is my is my video lagging for you guys? I don't know if the video is lagging or my microphone's lagging. I want to make sure because I'm talking. I can see my video freezing up. No? Okay. Must just be on my computer or something. So good. Uh, so we head down to, to the gate. Uh, I forget exactly what gate we were at, um, like gate 10 or 14, something like that. Uh, and, and it was just like the anticipation of this trip has been sitting there for how many months now? 10 months. And we're sitting at the gate and we're just so excited to get on this plane. I mean, it was almost surreal. And because it's Japan Airlines, you know, I guess I didn't really think about it too much. But because it's not American Airlines, there are very few Americans on the plane, period. So between, you know, between coach and, and business class or anything else, you're one of the only you're one of the only Americans on the entire flight. So it's kind of weird when you're sitting at the gate and you know you're looking around and it's just you know pretty much you maybe maybe another American or two but other than it's, just, it's all Japanese people. So you automatically feel like you're kind of you know getting started with the whole trip. Uh, and I'm sure you wouldn't have that experience if you got on like American Airlines flight to Japan. But, you know, I started thinking about it. I'm like, man, if I was going to go to Japan, I would never book Japan Airlines other than using, you know, using points and for the experience. But you never think about it. So, yeah, we, uh, you know, they, they start calling for business class lineup and, you know, we get up and we're not in any hurry. And I can't even explain. So the plane is like brand new and we get we start boarding on and we're, you know, when we make the corner, so you're, you know, you're walking down the hallway and you get onto the plane, you make that, that right turn where you can kind of like look out and see your chairs and everything. It was automatically, it was like way more than I expected. It was beautiful. The lighting, they have overhead lighting. That's all led. And it's, it was lit like a, like a pinkish orange. It was morning time. So they lit it up like a, you know, kind of like a morning sunset. And then uh, you know, you're looking for your seat and you're automatically over one because the size of the plane is so much bigger than I'm used to. You know, I'm used to like maybe like a three, three or a two, three seating. And this is a, what is it? A two, three, two. So it's in its business, which is, you know, it's already way bigger. So it was, it was incredibly overwhelming. Uh, and they, they played just like 
beautiful music. You know, it's just, oh, it's crazy. So we find our seat and we sit down and my fiance is, you can just, she, she starts crying. She's got tears in her eyes. It was just so powerful. Um, the one thing that I don't do, and you know, I, I hope that a lot of you guys don't do is I don't take anything for granted and, you know, being on that plane and knowing that, you know, what we do here with the subreddit and, and how we accumulate these miles and using them and everything, man, it was just, it was incredibly powerful. It was moving. It was, it was awesome. And so when you, when you make the corner and you, and you find the, um, your, your actual chair, you already have like all kind of, a, you have your amenity kit there. Um, you have, I'm trying to think of everything you had there, like a blanket, a mini kit. You had your slippers. I have a pair of slippers. They're downstairs. I didn't, I didn't, you know, they're nothing really too special. They're just kind of like little slippers. This is your mini kit for business class. So it comes in like a harder case. It's, um, it's almost like a pleather, like a fake leather, I'd call it, but it's a hard case, which is nice. And then when you open it up, um, it's kind of like divided into two sections. So it's um, like a elastic band there and one down here. And it didn't really have a whole two lot in it, kind of basic stuff. Uh, they give you like um, chapstick stuff. It's really super liquidy and it was kind of weird. So a little bit waxy. Um, they give you some JL tissues, which is uh, kind of cool. Didn't use them. Uh, they give you some other stuff too, which... I don't know exactly what I'll give you. They give you toothbrushes. So how about every single place gives you toothbrushes? Like if if you are gonna go to Japan, so anybody I know there was a couple people going, don't pack it, don't even worry about packing a toothbrush. You will have 30 of them by the time your your uh, trip's done. Every hotel, every uh every amenity kit that you get, everything gives you a toothbrush. There's there's toothbrushes in the bathrooms, it's it's crazy. Um, so what else we got here? They give us a uh, like a little, I don't know, if you want to spend some money on something, you can buy luggage. Um, they're always about spending money, you know? They give you an iPad or a little uh, sleep eye thing, whatever. There was a couple other things they give you. Um, ear Earplugs, they give you that. Um, and they, they had the headphones. They give you a set of headphones to borrow. They were Sony. Um, Sony headphones. Uh, noise canceling, and it worked really, really well. Um on the, on the way back, they give you bows, and the Sunday ones were just about every bit as good. I can't, I seriously cannot complain. Um, you know, the the headphones were, were really good quality. So, uh, yeah, I mean, just the whole flight was, was magnificent. We, as soon as you sat down, they offered you the pre-departure drink. So I took a mimosa, um, started early with the alcohol. That's my style. Uh, as soon as I get on a plane, I like to drink so I can knock myself out for the flight. Um, I know it's like, I think Lumpy or somebody, the way, you, the way they said it was, you know, and it's the truth is that you fly business or first class so that you're rested when you land. Um, so I took that advice to heart and I made sure I got my rest in over, you know, being overwhelmed by the whole experience. I wanted to make sure that I slept good so that I woke up and I was ready to go when we got to Kyoto because that was, uh, you know, after the couple hours on the plane of, of getting used to it and getting your meal served and everything else, you know, from there, it's time to uh, get some sleep, wake up, so you're rested in the morning. Um, so meal service was pretty amazing. It's like a five-course meal they give you. Uh, starts... You know, with, with all these French terms, I don't even know what the hell they are, to be honest with you. Um, you know, they got the, um, like, three different sets of appetizers. Uh, they give you, they, when you, you obviously, if you're unaware, they give you two menus. You get the French, or French, you get a Japanese menu, or you get a, a Western menu. So the Western menu was, like, a steak, uh, some type of, maybe, like, a... You know, like a, some type of fish, a lobster, tuna, something like that. Um, and then the Japanese menu is like an overwhelming 30 course set of every single thing that's Japanese you get in the serving. It's like it comes out in a box of, you know, 20 different things that you get. So we went with the, I went with the Western because I'm not really much of a adventurous eater. 
I know that's probably blasphemy when you say you're going to go to Japan. Um, but no, we, we mostly, uh, we stuck with the Western menu on the way there. And it was amazing. The, the steak was, was great. It was fantastic. Um, I, I, you know, I, I went with, they give you like a salmon, uh, kind of like an appetizer plate, a salmon something. And I'm not much of a seafood eater, but, you know, I figured I'm going to be in Japan, so I got to try a lot of seafood. So I ate everything. I thought it was excellent food, uh, really good. Um, a lot of people say it's the best food that you're going to get on a plane. And then they say, the, the review I read, I forget who said it, um, said Japan Airlines business class will be the best food you'll ever eat on any airplane. And then the JAL first class will be the best food that you'll likely ever eat anywhere. So I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, it's a good way to kind of sum it up and at least partially I have to agree, even though I don't have the experience of flying a lot of flights, uh, the food was really good. I don't think we had anything that was, uh, you know, it was bad at all. So, you know, our meal was excellent. Uh, I drank a lot of alcohol and then I fell asleep. Um, the wait staff was impeccable, even in business. So there's a lot of seats because that, that plane, what I didn't realize is that the plane seats, um, like two thirds of it is business class. And then maybe, you know, a, one six of it is, uh, economy plus, and then, you know, the, the rest of it is economy. So it's a very big business oriented class plane. Uh, there's not a whole lot of economy seats on it. Um, but still the wait staff was fantastic. And, you know, every time that you needed something, you pressed a button and they were there. Um, every seat has direct aisle access because they're kind of split back and forth, which I was a fan of. Uh, but I will say that the space, if you're sitting like on the window, the space to get into the aisle is really crowded. And you don't get as much table space. Um, I guess the last thing I want to say about that plane is that I get really hot. Uh, I like sleeping when it's like freezing cold. Like, I mean, if it's 30 degrees out, you know, I would sleep with no blankets. So I'm one of those type of people. And it was the plane is really warm. Uh, you'll read that on a lot of reviews, and they do keep it pretty warm. Uh, and then the double that, um, I always let my ladies sit next to the window. I almost always give her window seats. Um, but in this particular instance, I wanted to see the Aleutian Isles going over Alaska. So I, uh, I, uh, stole, I stole the window seat from her. She was fine with that. Um, but the, so the windows, they don't have any shades. They only use, it's like an automatic push button. And when you push it down, like you keep pushing it and it just gets darker and darker. But the problem is, is that it never blacks out. So even on the darkest setting, which it is pretty dark, but the sun beams right through the window and you can just like feel it burning on you. So that really sucked. I was not a fan of that. I, I wish it would have had, you know, like a shade I could have pulled down. Um, but that's, I guess that's kind of like a smaller complaint. It wasn't too big of a deal, but it's something to think about if you're, you know, if you're like really trying to keep cool, you know, maybe avoid the window seat. Yeah. First world problems. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's like truly, truly first world problems. So nothing, nothing too, too bad. Um, we landed well rested, hopped on the blitz train, um, getting around from the airport, uh, getting our, our JR passes. we got the JR pass, which you have to get if you're going to go down to Kyoto. It only makes sense. I forget how much money it is, but it gets you unlimited rail usage, uh, which you will utilize quite a bit if you're going to be there for a week. So you use our JR pass. Uh, use the, I think it's called the Narita Express line that takes you straight into um, Tokyo Station. And then from... Uh, Tokyo Station, or maybe we were in, um, forget one of the other places, uh, Shinagawa Station, one of those two stations, uh, we, we hopped from uh, there onto the Shinkansen bullet train line uh, from there to Kyoto. So it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a bad train ride at all. Uh, three hours, I think. Uh, she slept the whole way. I got one of those, um, Wi-Fi hotspot. So I, we, we could rent a high Wi-Fi uh, wi hotspot for, I think it was $30 for one week unlimited usage. So it was fantastic. I didn't have to worry about it. The battery life on those things were terrific. So literally on the bullet train on the way down, I was playing uh, video games. I didn't have anything else to do. So I bust out my laptop. I'm just playing a game on a train, you know, in Japan. It was wild. Um, so I know it was really neat. 
uh, we land, we get into Kyoto around, I'm trying to think, our plane, la our plane landed at, I want to say, 2.30 in the afternoon, even though it felt like midnight to us, but we slept a lot, so I mean, we were really, we were fine. Uh, and then we get to Kyoto pretty late, around 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, and Alan, I see you're typing here, I don't know if... Uh, Japan, they, they obviously they don't follow daylight savings time. I take it because it it got really dark early there, so I don't assume they have. Yeah, I said I didn't think so. So they have no daylight savings time, so it gets dark pretty early. Uh, that's something to consider when you're making your plans for these trips. That's not like uh, the states here where it's nine o'clock and you're fine. Um, so we we get into our hotel at I say I want to say like eight or nine o'clock. Let me just preference everything before I even get into Kyoto and I've already been talking for 20 minutes but when we we get our taxi and it's it's a little bit difficult to get around I'll touch on that but we get our taxi we get up to our to the Ritz Carlton uh, as soon as we roll up the the bellhop comes out he's wearing a beige trench coat suit with a full top hat I mean it looks awesome from you know from that very moment it was just already special they you know comes out, gets our bags for us, you know, welcomes us to the Ritz Carlton. Uh, everything is great. So online, I, I typed in what time we were going to be checking in roughly. You know, I always do that. So we walk down this just beautiful pathway. It's it's just amazing, breathtaking. When you walk from the little parking lot area into the main hotel, and then we go to where the front desk is at, to where you would check in. The woman uh, who checks us in is standing in front of the desk, and I just, as I'm walking up, she just goes, you know, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lapar automatically knows our names, knows we're checking in. She says, you know, please follow me. She escorts us right from right from the hotel lobby upstairs, takes us up the elevator, takes us to our room before we even check in, sits us down at our at our table that we have in our room and checks us in in our room it was so it was so amazing knew who we were knew everything it was so cool i never had an experience like that at any hotel so that was really special um got checked in and then uh the room you know i, I i'm not going to go on and on about it uh it's a hotel room but it is it was the most magnificent hotel i've ever stayed at um i think that the staff was uh were extremely professional they remembered you um so if you know if you went out one day and you you asked for directions to this place. When you returned in the afternoon, they said, hey, uh, how was you know such and such temple? They knew your face. They knew where you went. They were, their, their knowledge and, and um, or, you know, was, was astronomical. It was crazy. Uh, I know I couldn't do anything like that. I would never make it a day in that hotel, let alone, uh, you know, what they do. They do that every single day. So, um. Yeah, the hotel was just magnificent. We had a view of the mountains uh, the, and the river. So I think we got a room upgrade. Uh, we are Marriott Gold, or it's Carlton Gold, I guess, or same thing. Um, so they upgraded us to the luxury room, quote unquote. Uh, the view is just absolutely stunning. And you right over the mountains, you can watch the sun rise every morning. So it was just, oh man, it was so great. And the sun comes into the room, wakes you up, you know, 6.30 or so in the morning, gets you ready to go. Uh, we were up pretty early just because of the jet lag and stuff. So we were up every morning around 5.30 or 5 and trying to get out the door by you no know, later than 7. Uh, so, yeah, we, we visited a lot of Kyoto. Um, I don't want to, you know, go into, like, extravagant detail. I do have um, – I do have Alan, if you're still here, if you want to jump on with me. Alan, um, you can just click the call-in button on the side over here. There he is. Uh, let's see if I can click on accept. All right, should be bringing them up, hopefully. All right, yeah, Alan, you there? Yeah, you hear me? Hey, man. Yeah, how you doing? Nice seeing you again. Yeah, you too. Good to see you. So I want to, I want to, um, you know, introduce Alan real quick. He is, uh, well, if you want to introduce yourself, that's actually probably a little bit easier. Yeah, sure. Um, so right now I'm uh, an exchange student here in Kyoto. I've been here since September, and I actually go back to America in 
this coming weekend. Not too excited about that, by the way. But um, so I met up with Doug up uh, when he and his fiance came through last week and uh, showed them around a little bit, answered some stuff they had to ask about Kyoto. And oh, I feel being here for nine months and knowing Japanese myself, I feel like I'm fairly well equipped to give any sort of advice that you know anybody could ask. No, yeah, it was it was great. It was it was really cool um, because the one thing that you know I noticed the first thing about the trip was that there aren't. I, I've read a lot, you know, like oh, a lot of younger people speak English, and you're you know you'll be fine. And there's really that's not the case. Like nobody really <laughs> speaks English there. <laughs> so, so to meet up, to meet up with you was really nice because it was kind of refreshing. I could actually, you know, talk some more, and it was. It was I could imagine if you were by yourself, it'd be really difficult, you know, to. I mean, you basically just have to be silent for you know however long you're there. There's nobody to talk to. Right. Um, so, it was, but it was still it was nice to see. You. It was nice to like actually, you know, get a little bit of knowledge, walk around, and and the way that you know, I, I know you said you're not proficient, but just flipping between. The Japanese and English was really cool in the restaurants <laughs> and things. It helped out, so that no, was really neat. No, no problem. So, no problem. You've been you've been there for you said nine months now. Talk just yeah. if you could a little bit about give people an idea like the how society is like. I know super clean. I know that was one <laughs> thing I I certainly noticed. Um, they're they're friendly. I and I've heard you know I, I know that I haven't had any problems, but I've heard that you know they're kind of like. I don't know. They can be like a fake friendly almost, but I didn't, I mean, it didn't appear that way, but that's just kind of what I hear. Um, the say were like I said, super clean. There was no trash cans on the street, which I thought was weird. Just kind of stuff like that, you know? Yeah, sure. Or even the family that you've been staying with for so long, you've been, you've been staying here for nine months with the family. So. Right. So as part of my program, um, I've been staying here with a Japanese family for nine months. So they call it a homestay. So, you know, I get like kind of this nice perspective of domestic life. I get to practice every single day. And otherwise, let's see. Kyoto, I think, is a kind of a special case because, you know, it used to be a capital a long, long time ago. And it's certainly not Tokyo or Osaka. It still kind of has that old world feel to it. But as far as like how Japanese society goes in general, like you said, like, you know, there's this idea that, you know, oh, Japanese people are always really nice. But also, like you said, it's sometimes a little bit of a front, I guess. They don't really know, you know, what they're really feeling under. They don't really tend to show their emotions out too much. Um, no trash cans on the street. Yeah, that, that tends to be a thing that surprises some people. Um, I think you're really expected to, if you're buying food at a food stall, you're expected to eat it right there because they have trash cans there as well. You just you eat, you throw it, you don't really eat and walk. That's not really a thing that they do too much there. Um, yeah, certainly. We, we noticed that even in the train stations, I mean, everywhere you go. And, and what's funny is that, so they have vending machines on every single street oh, corner God, has a vending machine. Machines. I love them and so much. <laughs> And they're like they're like the same the same twenty drinks in every single machine. And then mm. once you get a drink, if you were to walk around with it, like you're stuck with it now. Like, you know, you pretty much have to keep it <laughs> until you get back to the hotel room because you know there's nothing else to do. There's literally no public trash cans. I mean, at, uh, yeah. at, this, at the stations you see a couple, but other than that, I, you know, it was pretty pretty tough. Well, some of the machines they have like a little bin that you can put your cans or your pet bottles into. Right. Um, train right. stations are also okay. Convenience stores also like if you really need to you know, lose some trash, they tend to have some trash cans out in front and recycling bins as well. But yeah, no, I mean it, we certainly noticed. Like I said, the way I think you kind of touched on was, and somebody else said, you know, why so many days in Kyoto? And I think for us, we wanted to. Kyoto, it really is different. I, I think mm -hmm. Tokyo is is very similar to a New York or right. you know some of the bigger cities. Kyoto really is special. It's uh, do, do you know the population of Kyoto roughly? Um, not off the top of my head, but I can grab it for you right now. Um, yeah, one point five million as of twenty ten, and you know well, that's, so I mean, Osaka is about twice as big, and Tokyo, you know, is much much bigger than that. So because of that, yeah. I think it still retains. I know. It's not exactly a small town, but it sort of has like you know the small town feel kind of it. You know what I mean? No, that's that's exactly, and that's why we stayed so many days down there because it's still it does it has the small town feel. It's easy, but it's big enough to where they have the infrastructure to, infrastructure to get you around. Uh, the rail is just incredible there, and Kyoto Station is one of the main hubs for all the area. So right. it's a great place to get around um, using the local lines, the local transit lines, but then. Yet you have the infrastructure for that, but yet you can still 
walk the city, um, you know, to a certain degree. Mm. And it's, you know, you're walking through smaller streets and there's no, they don't have really any buildings that like kind of tower. I mean, I guess if you go downtown, downtown, but yeah, most downtown, of the buildings really. are smaller. Yeah, it, it was it was really a different feel to it. And, I, and that's what we enjoyed and that's what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. So that's why we stayed so many nights in Kyoto compared to Tokyo or Osaka. Um, I mean, Tokyo was great too. It was, don't get me wrong, it was fantastic. But yeah, they do it. It kind of has that similar feel to it, you know, more or less. And it's just unique being in a, in a city like Kyoto. And then, for what, how many how many temples there are? Oh, man, there's a. I can't even count. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's probably so a couple many. hundred at least. And at, then, least. at least, yeah, out of the major ones, there's probably like eight or 10 major ones that, you know, mm. you, like you have to go to. Um, right. But we found it, there's a lot of walking. So, I mean, if, if uh, um, you know, if, if, if walking is not your thing, it, it, taxis are kind of expensive. Uh, I don't know yeah, how, yeah. you know, I don't really take too many taxis around the rest of the world, but uh, we did a lot of walking, but we found it, you know, pretty easy to get around. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful city. It's really unique. Um, we noticed that, so like when you go down to the train stations and stuff, they're bustling at, you know, six, seven in the morning. But then if you walk out into like the outskirts of the city, the city doesn't really wake up until around nine o'clock, it seems. Is, uh, is that kind of true around your area as well? Sort of, yeah. I mean, if you're, I guess, a young family with young kids who are still like up until high school, like the norm for them is getting up around six, seven o'clock to go to early classes. So for me, at least, since I live in mainly kind of like that school kid kind of neighborhood, it's still, it's pretty bustling by the time I leave for school about seven, eight every morning. But otherwise, if you're in one of the, you know, the really kind of far out areas where they're just, you know, kind of elderly families that run like a mom and pop shop, yeah, they don't really start to get going until, like you said, about, you know, nine, 10, even 11 sometimes they don't open up. Yeah, it's interesting because I noticed a lot of the place, a lot of buildings were, you know, the shops and stuff were closed until nine. Um, but no, we, like I said, the temples were all open pretty early. We, we were able to get to them right when they opened up. Um, I didn't feel like it was overcrowded. Is that is this your busy time of the year? Uh, right now, um, like starting about last week, like right when you came in, um, that Monday is actually, it's the day that most of the country goes back to school. So yeah, it's busy again, but I would say that you know, I guess for anybody else who's planning um, Japan travel, if you can go, like, I guess there's a bit of a trade-off, right? So if you go during times where it's break for everybody, so that's like uh, golden week, silver week, or during winter or summer break for the kids, you tend to, I guess, run into a lot of the locals while you're out and about. It's a little bit more crowded. But on the other hand, if you go at times where it's just, you know, business as usual, then if you, you know, try to get on trains during rush hour, it's, you know, it's pretty bad. It can get pretty crowded. For people who like to have their own person on the train, it's just not a fun time for you. That's what I would say. You have zero space on the train. I def I took the the local train um, to Nara, and there was not no, it wasn't Nara. It was um, well, it might have been over to see you. Um, oh yeah. Okay. And, and it was like literally, we were being pushed into the trains. It was so. <laughs> crowd i mean it was as funny as that i mean i'm 5 10 and i felt like it's just a giant it was crazy i've you know it was just the population in general is a little bit shorter so it was really unique because mm -hmm. I, I just wasn't used to that you know and there's, there's obviously there's some tall people but it was weird feeling tall it was uh it was different and yeah if you if you if you have any respect for your local space the local trains are enough for you <laughs> like you're, you're better paying the 20 bucks and taking the taxi I, I of course i'm not like that i'd rather i think it's part of the experience i mean that's uh, japan's for known sure. for those trains and so i thought it was really neat but for those of you guys who are looking to avoid that kind of crowd um i think only if you're taking like a limited express or the shinkansen you can opt for what are called reserve seats so when you buy your ticket you're assigned a seat as well so you're guaranteed a seat somewhere on the train whereas if you don't you're either standing or you're going to have to just find an open seat and then sit there yourself so that's something i would advise if you're looking into it and i was fine you know and getting around is not hard so they have like mm -hmm. local trains rapid trains they have the bullet trains you know whatever they call them. It, it really wasn't hard at all getting around and, and getting to the, those right trains mm -hmm. um but and the only busy train was that local train other than that it was really easy to get around it was fine we had seats um people you know if if we 
if you were sitting in somebody's reserve seat, you just get up and move. It wasn't really a big deal. Right. Um, but no, it was just the local trains were a little bit tough. But other than that, it was fine. Did you find that, you know, even without speaking Japanese, you were still able to navigate the train system okay? Yeah, the train system had no problem at all, especially, you know, because the numbers are, are universal. So I just would point on a map and say, like, I'm going here. And then, you know, somebody would say, you know, 16. And I'd be like, okay, I got to go to 16. So it was really, I'd have no problem with trains. The only problem we had really were taxis. Um, yeah. So the, <laughs> They I have, think even like they have, the locals tend not even to take the taxis. You know, everyone either walks bikes or take public transit. Yeah, and with Google Maps, it was really easy to walk around. Uh, so we had mm -hmm. no issue with walking. The only issue we had, like I said, were taxis. So if I, I mean, I could say, like, where are you going? I'm like, Ritz Carlton Hotel. And he'd look at you like, what the hell did you just say? And I'm like, <laughs> Ritz Carlton Hotel. And then I'd show him on a map and I'd point to him. And I'd say like Ritz Carlton, and he and he'd be like, "Oh, oh Ritz Carlton!" Like, yeah, that's exactly what I just said, <laughs> like six times. You know, so it's kind of funny. Uh, but really, no, I mean, we had no issue at all. So it was a great trip. We loved well, it. glad to hear. So, all right, Alan, I'm gonna appreciate you stopping in. Um, no I'll let you go. Get back to your day. It's what? It's uh, ten thirty in the morning. Ten thirty in the morning. I've got a whole day ahead of me. Right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Get ready to get started. So appreciate you stopping in, and yeah. uh, definitely I'll check in check in with you here shortly. And uh, at least I appreciate all the help you've given us. Yeah, no problem. Take it easy. All right, man. See you. All right. So yeah, that was Alan. I said it was great to meet up with him. Uh, yeah, no, the, there are Wi-Fi hotspots available a lot. There's actually citywide Wi-Fi. I found the citywide Wi-Fi to be kind of hit and miss. Uh, we didn't have a whole too much luck with it. Um, but we had our own hotspot, so I didn't like use it. I didn't have to rely on it too much. Uh, the, the mobile hotspot, just get one. It's $30, and they are absolutely amazing. I mean, no matter where you're at, you have full service. It's fast service, too. It's not like a, you know, like an edge network type thing. You're getting you know, 8, 10 megs down uh, service, so it's really great. The mobile hotspots are just by and far the way to go. And when you're getting your JR Pass, I think we got ours from like jrpass.com or... Um, let me see here. Actually, look up that real quick. Uh, we got our pass from. It might have actually been jrpass.com. And I'm looking on here. It was a little bit more expensive. I think they charge you like a little bit extra of a fee or whatever. Yeah, it's just jrpass.com. They give you the option to rent the Wi Fi, um, you know, add it on to that. So it just, it's all one purchase. And what's great is that uh, with, with the uh, jrpass.com, I booked it with the arrival and it didn't show up as a, as a, you know, travel purchase, but I called up uh, Barclays. I told them, you know, it was for train tickets. They allowed me to reimburse everything, including the Wi-Fi hotspot. So we got our train tickets and the Wi-Fi hotspot, you know, included with the arrival points, which was great. Um, SoftBank was, uh, who we, uh, whose ours was through. Finding the place in the airport was a little bit of a pain. I think it was like the QL booth is where you would pick up the Ninja Wi-Fi. I don't think it really said it too much, but they do have it everywhere. So, um, yeah, I mean, Kyoto was, which, like I said, it had that small town feel. It was great. The temples were absolutely magnificent. They were beautiful. Um, just absolutely great trip. Uh, from there, we took the train up to Tokyo. Um, and... Like I said, again, Ritz-Carlton, if you have, if you sign up for Ritz-Carlton, that's what we did. We signed up for Ritz-Carlton. So we used American Airlines miles to get over there. With the loophole, that was incredibly easy to get business in first class. It was a no-brainer for us. Uh, we had the miles to do it. Why not? You got to burn them. So we used that for our for our rail pass. We used the Barclays arrival, pay for both of our JR passes and the Wi-Fi hotspot. For four nights in the Ritz-Carlton, we both signed up for the Ritz-Carlton card. We had two free nights each. We combined the reservations, made it one reservation uh, with the uh, Ritz-Carlton card or maybe the Platinum card. They gave us uh, Marriott Gold, which got us upgraded to the mountain view with the with the uh, river. It was terrific. So we had four nights there. Uh, we head back up to Tokyo. I used 25,000 UR points, booked the Andes, um, Tokyo. So the, the check-in experience at this hotel, awesome as well. They have a um, like a front table, 
And then they kind of have like a sitting area, like kind of like a relaxing area. Uh, when you walk up to the front desk and you say you're going to check in, they just escort you over to this like big uh, lounge area. You sit down there, they come over, they sit down with you, and then that's how they check you in. So there's no real like check-in stand that you're used to in every other hotel. So that happened twice back to back. Um, they check you into your room. It is on the, uh, I forgot what the building is called. Somebody wants to tell me how the Toramon, Toramon Hills building, which is the, I think the second largest uh, building in all of Tokyo. Uh, it's right up there. It's like very close to the tallest uh, Toramon, yeah, Tornamano, Toramon building. Uh, the sky tree is bigger, but it's it's much bigger, but it's uh, it's not a building. So the actual building why well, it was the biggest building or second biggest building in all of Tokyo. Uh, the the hotel takes the top four or five floors. So when you go to this hotel, it's not like 50 floors of a hotel. Of course, it'd be like way too much. It is like four floors. So it doesn't matter where you're at. There, the building has 360 degree view of Tokyo and your room will have just an absolutely incredible view. You cannot go wrong with this hotel. Uh, so, you know, we checked in in the lounge area that we, we took us up to a room. The room was a lot smaller uh, than, than it was in uh, Kyoto, uh, the Ritz Carlton. But it was equally as nice, if not a little bit nicer, maybe in terms of the bathroom and the entrance area. Uh, the bed was a lot smaller. Ritz Carlton's bed was like two kings side by side. It was amazing. Uh, like you woke up and you know in the morning, I had to actually like call my fiance cell phone to, to like talk to her because she was so far away on the other side of the bed. It was um, it was like the craziest thing. I've never seen a bed that big. Um, so the the. Uh, the Andes in Tokyo, though, just absolutely magnificent view. Um, I, I had, all right, here we go. I do, my pictures finally came through. So let me save, let me save these photos real quick. I'll show you guys the view from our room and then uh, from the top of uh, the building. So at the top of the building, there's a bar, like I said, it's 51 floors. The check-in lobby is on the 51st floor. And then they have a bar, they call it the rooftop bar or something. It's like partially outdoors, partially indoors. Uh, and up there, the 52nd floor um, is, you can actually, they have a like a terrace out there that you can walk out and you're completely out outdoors um, overlooking the city. And that was just incredible. And I, like I said, I have some pictures I can show you guys to really give you a sense of how high up you are. So let me go to my... Uh, downloads here I can't want this one this one this one and this one I'll bring up these four I'll put them in an album okay so my photos are uploading right now so I'll have that link here in a second and I'll just put it right onto the chat um, but no it was incredible uh, it was just absolutely amazing how the, the hotel was just so high up uh, you could see Tokyo Harbor the sky tree, the Ferris wheel and everything was, it was incredible. Uh, the hotel staff, uh, top notch. Seems like the hotel staff at any, any of those nicer hotels in, in Japan, it's going to be the best service you're going to get on any, any hotel. Uh, they, they just, they're so attentive. Uh, it's one of the few times in any hotel where I can say like, they know what you're in need of and then they offer you help and assistance before that you even, um, you know, before you can even ask for it. Uh, when you're walking downstairs in the morning, you take the elevator downstairs and, you know, you get ready to walk out. You have somebody there opening the door for you, asking if you need a, a taxi, where you're going to be going. Uh, and then they let the taxi driver know where you're going. So it saves you the hassle of trying to explain to a taxi driver where you're trying to get to. So things like that, like small things that just end up being a magnificent experience. The, the restaurant that they have in the Andes is one of the nicest restaurants I've ever ate at. It was absolutely incredible uh the just the, the decor the art the ambiance of everything it was just unbelievable um and then like i said that the, the bar at the top was awesome as well so here is yeah and it really is the hospitality is is everything to them um okay so i just put up the link it should hopefully show up there we go 
oh wow look at that you can actually click next right on there i don't know if you guys can see it but yeah so that's the view um so do you guys is everybody is everybody see the view right now or is it just kind of like a slideshow everybody can change it either way uh if you flip through the second image you can see the view uh that's the view from the the room it was absolutely amazing just looking down and at night especially you can overlook everything and just look on forever it was amazing and then uh the third picture that's us standing on top of the building so that terrace is kind of closed off they uh it's it's closed off for like private parties only i guess the public isn't really uh, allowed up there um but so i i just asked and one of the staff a lot of us out there to take a picture so that was pretty cool uh and then the fourth photo uh that's us on the jl first class which i want to touch on very quickly and then i can um answer some questions or whatever else anybody has so uh now the andos great hotel in, in tokyo definitely recommend if you're going to stay there um i did a lot of research i took the andos over the grand and over the park hyatt uh i feel like i made the right decision i like like the chic kind of hip feel of the andos more than the luxury that like the park may offer so that's the reason that we picked it and um you know i feel like we made the right choice so i'm gonna go ahead and close out of this uh, box there we'll lock that seat up and i want to touch on we wait we get up in the morning we head up to the airport um got there a little bit early and we awaited our first class J japan airlines first class flight which was just magnificent so i kind of had an experience with the with the business class on the way down so i knew kind of wasn't you know what i was in for um i just explained first class as being exactly like business class in terms of uh, attention uh, maybe a little bit more attentive you have a lot of flight attendants constantly walking up and down they, these people like they don't sit down they're always constantly up walking the aisle so if you ever need anything you don't even need to like press a button you know you don't need to, to do anything like that it's like they're right there all you gotta do is just you know kind of signal for them um when you sit down in your um first class seat you get the low amenity kit uh some of the top line products it was absolutely great so they give you a whole selection of stuff if you're an amenity kit saver you get everything so they give you the eye the uh, you know for the eyes uh which is nice i'm gonna throw sort of stuff on the bed they give you a moisture mask which i don't know what you're supposed to do i guess it looks like one of those medical masks that everybody wears uh everybody wears in japan but you put put this over your your mouth and i guess it helps with the moisture because it is a little bit dry up in the air a couple cards i guess to just to buy some stuff this says uh welcome on board thank you for choosing japan airlines yada yada uh, they give you this little guy right here uh this is earbuds so they give you earbuds in this uh put that there to give you a comb a brush so if you don't if you don't have a comb or a brush i don't know a dental kit didn't even open this up um feels like toothpaste mouthwash maybe a toothbrush probably a toothbrush they always give you a toothbrush let's actually let's open it who cares what am i gonna do with it let's see so you guys get to uh enjoy this with me so there's toothpaste mirror dent toothpaste mouthwash go figure and ah a little toothbrush exactly they give you everywhere you go i've had like 20 toothbrushes from this trip it's amazing they give you this stuff i don't know what it is is it like cologne it's like a perfume maybe cologne perfume something like that it's pretty sweet man I like to go the whole nine yards huh some tissues revitalizing towel which when you're on this when you're on the flight you get a towel every three seconds they come by with a with a hot towel or a cold towel uh, and then some lip balm which is really nice stuff actually it's a little bit a little bit hard um you get a really nice case to hold everything in so i was happy with that i was thinking man like that's a nice amenity kit that's pretty sweet and then they come by and they hand you this guy so in this guy you have um three more products it's just a a face cleanser a or a cleansing foam 
This is a hydrating lotion and then a uh, total revitalizer face something. Uh, it's, it's more or less like a shaving pit, I guess. Uh, they give you instructions on how to use it because good thing, because uh, I don't live that life. So it was, uh, you know, I was like, what the hell do I do with all this stuff? Um, they give you a chocolate and it comes in this sweet box. Um, I don't, so I already ate the chocolate, of course. It's like one person, but it's nice, nice chocolate. And then for the women, instead of the shaving kit, they give you this uh, mask thing. They give you a couple lotions and an essence here, and then some type of a towel thing. And it comes in a big box, and that's what the women get. So a little bit of both. Uh, would, I, would I do it again? Absolutely, I'd do it again. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, I'd do it again. I'd do it again tomorrow if I could. Uh, that was amazing. Well, certainly, it was worth it. I, I thought, I think for me, you know, the first class might have been a bit much, um, especially now that the miles have gone up. But I would certainly uh, do business class again. The plane was awesome. The ambiance of the plane was just magnificent. And I felt like the service was every bit just as good. First class may have been, like I said, it was a little bit nicer. But trust me, the, business, the service you get on business class is nothing to scoff at. So as I'm looking through the, like the alcohol list, I, I took a couple of pictures because like um, the Salon Champagne, which is so special. Uh, it's only served for first class on Japan Airlines. So I take the picture of, of the menu and the stewardess who's like always right beside you, no matter what you do, they're always right there. And she's like, oh, no. And she goes, you you take, take home. So she gave me the, the drink menu. It's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, you can see some of the options you have. There's the salon champagne. Um, you can look up all this stuff online. You know, it's nothing, nothing really, you know, uh, too too special. You can always look it up online. But um, I'm, I'm a. I, I did drink a lot of the salon. It was really good. I'm not much of a champagne drinker, so I don't know what's good or what's not. But all I know is I could drink a boatload of it. Um, and, and in terms of whiskey, they had the uh, Chivas Royal. Uh, it was 21 year, and the Habiki 17 year old. I had a couple glasses, or at least one glass of each of those, uh, and that was back to the Those were really smooth. Uh, whiskey so i was really happy with that and like i said the the food if, if you look on that um let me bring up that photo of us okay here we go so that photo of us on, on the jl first class i mean like that says that says everything i mean we, you're, you're literally you have enough room to where you can sit there and eat dinner together. Uh, so that's what we did. You know, as soon as the meal service started, I, I jumped over there. Uh, the, the TV is a little bit warm on your back, so you got to turn off the television, uh, which it shouldn't be on anyways. But of course it was for us because I was kind of showing the flight map in the background. Uh, but it's amazing. I mean, you could, you have plenty of room. We weren't, it wasn't even like, I know it looks kind of tiny of a table, but it was plenty of room for both of us to sit there and, and enjoy a nice meal. Uh, the food was excellent from start to finish like it was it was again it was like a five course meal um but it was great food amazing service i, I have video uh i did take a little video of our dinner service so i'll be able to upload that on youtube and have that in my uh my full review which will come out probably in the next uh, week or two after i get uh everything situated and, and back on track uh so yeah i mean was was the mileage like was was it over the extra miles for first class, uh, I had to do it for the experience. And I think you have to do it for the experience. But outside of the experience, I don't feel like I got much better sleep or better service in first class than I did in business class. Um, so for me, no, I would stick with, I'd stick with business class, um, but you have to try it just, just to do it. Uh, it really is special. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. Like I said, my, my expectations were really high when I went in. Uh, from everything I've read, and even though I've never taken a first-class flight, I still had really high expectations, and I feel that they, uh, I feel that they really exceeded. You know, they exceeded everything. Um, so, if that's how I do I usually redeem for JRY? I don't redeem. <laughs> that's I, I don't know if you were here earlier. I don't redeem. That was my first ever international flight. So, uh, so do I read? Do I usually redeem for J or Y? No, I usually re uh, redeem for J or F because uh, <laughs> that's all I've flown. Moving forward, I, I think if it's if I go back to 
a flight like Asia again, where I'm talking 12 hours, ain't probably anything over like a 10 hour flight, I'm probably going to be flying business class just because of the extra comfort. You can sleep better. Everything's going to be a lot nicer. Uh, probably if I was going to go to Europe, I'd fly coach. I'm not really too concerned about something like that. I guess it depends on the routing too. But yeah, if you, if you need to, um, you know, if you want to get rested, you have to fly, you got to fly business at least. It really is nice. And it does the fly. It does depend on the airline. So, I mean, we were American airline, you know, rich, um, not, not really so much anymore. That flight costs us, that trip costs us a lot. Uh, but you know, to stretch things out, you know, I, I'm going to fly economy when I can. Um, if it's a long, long flight, I would definitely pay to upgrade at least one way to, um, J just because the, uh, You know, the, the service is nice and you get there and you're ready to go, which is extremely nice. So, you know, I kind of covered everything. Wow, this is a lot of talking. Um, what are there, what, are, what questions do everybody have? I know there's people said they're going to be going. What are you kind of concerned about? What are you thinking about? Um, on the U.S. carrier, sure, but who wants to fly? No, I'm with you. I'm actually with you. I, I don't see, if you're going to be flying a Pacific, if you're going to be flying a Trans-Pacific flight, you're not going to be flying a U.S. carrier. There's zero sense. I mean, Cathay is, you know, Cathay JL, either one of those, Singapore. you got so many choices when you go over to Eastern Asia. I wouldn't know. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to fly like American or United, something like that. If you're flying in Europe, you know, you know, your choices are a lot tougher. How to get an Admirals Club membership? You, I didn't. I don't have Admirals Club membership. You get access to the club if you fly um, international first class. So even even like they're on the way back in Chicago, uh, they had their one of their flagship lounges, um, which you know with our F ticket we were able to get access to, um, and it was beautiful. It was a really nice lounge. I, I thought it was great. Uh, the Sakura Lounge in Narita. It was it was really exceptional. The check-in experience was great. Uh, when, when you're looking for the check-in gates and you see Japan Airlines, the first class check-in has a big red carpet. Uh, it has a stewardess standing right outside. As soon as you walk up to her, she takes your bags, uh, puts them on the carrier for you, which I felt bad because she probably weighed, you know, 50 pounds and my bag was like 70. So I, I felt terrible. I, like, I, I felt like I had to help her out. Um, but no, it was, it was, you know, like the whole experience, they check your bag in. Uh, as soon as they check your bag in, you know, are, are you going to be going into, are you going to be going into the Sakura Lounge? You know, yeah, I think, you know, absolutely. They escort you uh, through security and uh, you have your own private security line and it's not what you think. So it's not like private security, like, like TSA pre-check kind of a thing. I'm talking, it's in a, it's in its own private room. And there is nobody there. There is a metal detector. There is a, a conveyor belt and like three officers standing there and nobody else. It, it is the weirdest thing. And it's just like a small little, like a bedroom almost. And, uh, you know, you put your stuff through and you're like in and out of there in just literally seconds. And as soon as you walk through right across the hall, that's where the Sakura Lounge is at. The Sakura Lounge had a, had a sushi bar in the lounge, which was terrific with uh, three chefs standing there. Um, the, the food spread was, was great. We got a drink, some curry, a couple other things. All, other food was really good. And then the service, they're just top notch, just like the airplane. Uh, you know, they, they do not stop walking around, looking at tables, making sure all everything's collected. Uh, it was just an incredible experience. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, I didn't redeem miles because, uh, I just started. I mean, I, I've been doing this for a couple of years, and I, and I have a lot of miles. But when you're booking these first class flights, you know, you have to book so far in advance. So I booked that flight ten months ago, and I finally just got to take it. Uh, so I have. Um, I'm flying business class in Iberia here in October. Uh, I've got a couple of domestic trips uh, planned out throughout the year. Uh, then we'll go from there. Uh, how long does it take to get the pre-check? Um, I don't. No, you don't need a pre-check interview, I don't believe. I think pre-check you can pretty much get for, you can pretty much get that, um, 
you know, right away. Uh, it, for global entry, that's what you get for um, for a couple of the cards, like uh, the platinum card, and, and uh, you know, a couple other ones reimburse you for global entry. For global entry, you actually go through an interview process, which the interview process itself takes about mm, ten seconds, but it takes you like at least three months to get an interview, typically. Uh, so it's really tough to get the interview, but once you finally schedule your interview and you get you get your pre your, you walk in, it's literally like, why do you want global entry? Uh, because I'm traveling a lot. My credit card gives it to me for free. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, are you planning on doing a lot of trips? No, not really. Probably just like one or two a year. Okay, here you go. Just put your fingerprints down, and, and that's it. And getting in using global entry is like by and far one of the greatest things of all when it comes to credit card rewards. Definitely take advantage of that perk. Um, it is amazing. You, all the all those security lines getting into the country, you just walk up to a kiosk, slide your passport. Is this your flight? Yes. Do you have anything to you know you want to bring into country? No to all. You um, put your fingerprints down. It takes a picture of you, and you're out of there. That's literally it. Uh, absolutely amazing. Global entry is one of those best things that you're ever going to get uh, in terms of credit card churning. It, it's better than freaking airline miles, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so it was, it was just terrific. Certainly worth it. Um, I know it's a pain to get, get the interview process, but it saves you so much time. Uh, we went through, we've used it a few times now, come back from Jamaica and Japan. Like I said, it just saves you so much time. And not only time, but like, I hate standing in lines. I don't care if I'm standing in line for like 20 minutes. I just hate it because I feel like I'm wasting time. And I don't like to waste time. I like to continuously move. So Global Entry allows me to do that. If Even if it's, you know, if there's nobody standing in line at the uh, rare line, you know, the regular lines, I just feel like I'm constantly moving, you know, when I go through Global Entry. So it was worth it. And Global Entry does include pre-check. And um, I've always had luck. Southwest, uh, Southwest, if you booked an international flight on Southwest, you do not get your pre-check ever. So just take that for note, you know, for whatever it's worth. I don't know what it is with their systems, but they actually confirmed it to me through Twitter, email, and in person. I thought it was crazy. So I checked through all three sources, and it's true. Their system right now, uh, does not include pre-check if you book an international flight. Uh, and the pre-check is beautiful as well. I, I'd i actually prefer the pre-check line over, you know, business class or first class line. Um, if you have like a light jacket, we I have a, a North Face, just, you know, real light jacket. Uh, you, you don't even have to take that off. So I, I can wear that through, wear your shoes, your belt. Just little things that take so much time. And generally, I, the thing I like about pre-check the most is that people in the pre-check line, they know what's up. So there's never anybody who's, oh, I forgot to take my wallet out or I forgot to take my watch off. They know what's going on. So you are always moving through, which is why I love pre-check more than um, you know, just going through a regular lines. It's not, you're not dealing with a bunch of people who are completely clueless as to how security goes. Um, I'm trying to say so pre-check is domestic. That's why it's not featured aboard. Yeah, no, but I mean, it is, it is domestic of course, but I've, I've had pre-check like my Japan Airlines flight. I had pre-check going into, I had a layover in Dallas. So I had a pre-check going into Dallas um, but if you're flying Southwest, if you're going to go from Pittsburgh to Orlando, Orlando to Jamaica, you will not get pre-checked from Pittsburgh to Orlando. So it's just really, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me why, why that's the case, but it is. Um, so that, I mean, that was it. That's our Japan trip in a nutshell. That's an hour long, uh, you know, talking about Japan, but it was an amazing trip. Uh, I, I certainly recommend if you have the to you know, go there and you're thinking about it, uh, don't hesitate. It, it's really unique. Uh, it, it's great in the, it's great in the sense that you're like in Kyoto and Tokyo, when you're walking the streets, it doesn't matter if it's late at night or early in the morning. There's never you never have any fear. Um, I can't say the same for you know, say 
Chicago, uh, New York, even Pittsburgh where I live, uh, I've never had quite that same, you know, feeling if, if you make a wrong, you make a wrong turn somewhere, you know, you're going to feel like you're, uh, you're going to know that you're in a bad area. I felt nothing like that in all of, um, my trip to, uh, Japan, no matter where you're at, you're, you're always, it's always, uh, friendly. It's, you always feel safe. Uh, you know, it's great. And what's, you'll, you'll see, you'll wake up in the morning and you're walking down the street and there's like seven year old kids running by themselves down the street to school. You know, it's, there's nothing, it's just normal practice for them. There's no fear of crime. The crime rate is so low. I think it's something like you're 20 times more likely to be shot in Chicago than you are to be robbed in Japan. So it's, it's kind of really gives you some perspective on crime rates in that country. Uh, it's not to say that, you know, it doesn't happen. It happens everywhere. Um, but it's just so, so much lower. So it's really neat. Um, so if that's not it, I'm going to go ahead and cut off the recording. Uh, we will have, I'll, I'll be here next week. Uh, we'll start back up. It's been a kind of a slow week in terms of churning. So I felt like it was a good week to talk about my trip anyways to Japan just because uh, not a whole too lot has gone on major scale and churning. Uh, I picked the right time to be gone. I was I was actually there uh, during the earthquake as well. I want to I'll touch on that really quick. Um, so I was watching TV and it comes across the TV. Everything in Japan makes really fun sounds. They they don't have anything scary. It's not like in this country where if a severe thunderstorm is rolling through, sirens are going off and it's burr, burr, burr. everything. In Japan is fun chiming sounds, so it's like diddling comes on, and it, and it just has all red. And it says early earthquake warning, something like that. And it says an earthquake is about to occur, is, is going to occur, something like that. Uh, be prepared for powerful tremors. And I know Japan to have earthquakes all the time, so I think nothing of this. It, it was a fun chiming sound. Yeah, I mean it's a red message, but. Like this stuff is the normal for them. So my fiance is in a bathtub. I'm like, hey, there's going to be, this says there's an earthquake happening or going to happen. And she's like, do I need to worry? And I say, no, no, you're fine. And it was uh, like you know, 45 seconds later or so, it came across the screen just in white text, but it said that whatever, like a 6.8 earthquake has occurred in Fuyuma, Japan. And I got thinking, I was, I mean, I was like, that's a really powerful earthquake earthquake i was like you know 6.8 i was like that's gonna that's like a devastating earthquake and it you know that's where it really hit me that they let you know a minute ahead that it was gonna happen and then you know it, as soon as it happened you knew about it and it kind of listed a lot of the cities and they rate it one through seven on a shake level they call it um and we didn't feel it in in kyoto at all um and then i they had 45 minutes later it was an aftershock uh, which was like a 6.5. And, you know, it could just be me. I swear that the the building, I didn't feel a shake, but you could hear the glass, like a knocking on the glass for just a couple of seconds. Uh, so I, I, I'm thinking, you know, the main quake, I didn't feel it all. The aftershock, um, you know, may have done a little, just a little shake, not enough to where I felt anything, but enough to where like I could kind of hear a little bit on the glass because, you know, I mean, there was nothing, there was no other explanation. It was like almost a, like a metal on glass sound, just real light for two or three seconds. So nothing too much uh, in terms of, you know, actually feeling the quake. And yeah, we, it was, Kyoto's pretty far away. It's, you know, it's 300 miles or so as the bird flies. Um, but no, it was, uh, you know, luckily we were fine. Uh, they did shut down the bullet trains for a little bit, but they had everything running back up, uh, you know, momentarily. They just shut down the line going toward Western Japan as you get for, way further down. But uh, no, it wasn't, wasn't anything bad for us, fortunately, but still kind of crazy that the one weekend, the one week that I decided to go over to Japan, they have that, you know, earthquake and it was sad. It's, they had a couple of them now, you know, two or three aftershocks have been just as bad as the original, if not worse. I think they had a 7.0 or a 7.2 uh, the day we left. Uh but no, it was, it was, that was a different experience as well. Yeah, definitely got the full Japan experience, that's for sure. So, 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and cut off the recording. I said I'll be here next week, guys, 9, 9 to 10 o'clock, uh, same place. Hopefully some things happen in the turning community, so I have a little bit more to talk about in terms of actually uh, turning itself. And we'll go from there.